The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 15194 in the name of Monica Lennon on cervical screening uptake. Uh, sorry, cervical screening uptake statistics. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. Call on Monica Lennon to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is Cervical Cancer Prevention Week, and I'm grateful to members who supported my motion to allow this debate to take place. There is actually a lot to be positive about when it comes to cancer of the cervix. Why? Well, it can largely be prevented through the HPV vaccination given to girls and soon boys in Scotland and through cervical screening, also known as a smear test. Tonight, with thanks to the fantastic campaigning and research led by Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust, we're going to talk about cervical screening and I hope we can focus on what more we can do in Scotland to make cervical cancer a disease of the past. This debate is critical because not enough women are attending their smear tests, an issue I know the Minister for Public Health is taking very seriously. Let's face it, no one likes having a smear test. Like too many women in Scotland, I myself have ignored reminder letters and missed my smear test in the past. It can be uncomfortable and many of us feel embarrassed to talk about it, never mind go to the appointment. The latest round of statistics reveal that the number of women not attending their regular screening is increasing. In fact, we're at an all-time low. Despite our nationwide cervical screening programme offered to women between the ages of 25 and 64, around one in four women don't attend their regular appointments. The uptake is even lower among younger women, despite the fact that cervical cancer is the most common cancer for women under the age of 35. Only 62% of women aged between 25 and 29 attend a regular appointment. Yet not attending smear test appointments is one of the biggest risk factors for developing cervical cancer. According to new research by Joe's Trust, young women don't go for their smear tests because they feel embarrassed or they feel scared, they feel vulnerable. Eight out of 10 admit that they are embarrassed. Difficulty in getting a suitable appointment time or time off work are also factors. So we have to remove this fear of the unknown and the worry around smear tests. Hashtag smear for smear is seeing high profile celebrities, campaigners and even politicians sharing um, a lipstick smeared selfie this week. After I shared mine on Twitter yesterday, a close friend said to me this was just what I looked like on a normal night out, a claim I strongly reject. And the WhatsApp discussion with my girlfriends that followed from that remark proved to me that it is good for women to talk about our health fears with one another. And perhaps a little bit of light-hearted humour can help with that. Katie Johnson from BBC The Social recently filmed her own experience of going for a smear test. As Katie says in the video, realistically, this is two minutes of your life. A little bit of awkwardness, sure, embarrassment, but it could stop cells in their tracks before they become cancer. Katie, who has endometriosis, got over her initial fear of the test because it is important, sorry, Katie, who has endometriosis, got over her initial fear of the test, but we do have to recognise that it's not an easy procedure for all women. The My Body Back project, based at the Sandiford uh, Clinic in Glasgow, provides a dedicated smear testing service for women who have experienced sexual violence. There are so many lessons to be learned from that project. We do need vital trauma-informed services as standard across the country. George Trust told me about Nicola, who's from Scotland. She was diagnosed with cervical cancer in 2015. Let Nicola's words sink in. I was diagnosed with stage 1B2 cervical cancer at age 35 after putting off my smear test for over a year. It was six weeks before I was due to get married overseas. I was devastated. The word cancer seemed to take over my whole life and the thought that I might not be around to see my two children grow up terrified me. I postponed my treatment for a few weeks until after my wedding because I thought if something were to go wrong then at least I could leave my husband, children and family with wonderful memories of our wedding and holiday together. 
A radical hysterectomy means I can no longer have children and I went into early menopause. The physical and psychological impact of cancer will never go away, but I look forward to the day that no one is diagnosed with cervical cancer. So what can we do to get the word out that cervical cancer can be prevented so that other women in Scotland don't have the same experience as Nicola? Firstly, the Scottish Government and George Trust deserve enormous credit for previous initiatives the Nip It in the Bud campaign ran last year. And that's exactly the type of awareness work that we need more of. The HPV vaccination programme also deserves massive credit. George Trust have been calling for Scotland to continue to lead the way by running a pilot of self-sampling, which could have a hugely positive effect on the levels of screening. And I was pleased to read reports today that the NHS in Scotland will pilot a scheme of self-sampling for women who have routinely not kept a regular appointment, and I look forward to seeing its results. More could also be done by health boards to monitor GP practices with a low uptake and to increase the availability of screening appointments. Samantha, who is one of my constituents in Hamilton, waited over two months for an appointment. Clearly that is not acceptable. Another wise woman, Leslie from Edinburgh, had this to say. Imagine we didn't get smear tests under the NHS. We'd all be campaigning to get them for free. It's literally a few minutes at the nurse, who's probably seen a lot worse than your lady garden, and so it's important and life-saving. And then there's a the novel initiative by a Glasgow beauty salon where Debbie Porter is offering free waxing services to women to encourage them to book their smear tests. As reported on Glasgow Live recently, Debbie posted on Facebook to her clients, being a wax specialist, I see many of you girls who admit you haven't been for a smear or are too scared to do so, yet you have me wax you for 20 minutes. I think Debbie has a point. In conclusion, there are many, many reasons why women put off their smear tests, but there is one overriding reason why they shouldn't. The tests protect against cervical cancer and can save lives. So I thank all of the women who have shared their experiences and thoughts with me, and of course, George Trust, and we have a number of volunteers and, and board members in the gallery tonight um, for all the amazing work that they do. Presiding officer, minister, colleagues, if we match our shared ambition with action, we can consign cervical cancer to the history books. Thank you. We move now to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Emma Harper, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. I would firstly like to congratulate Monica Lenning on, on bringing this important debate to Chamber today. It does give us the opportunity to raise awareness of the latest cervical cancer screening update statistics. And given that Cervical Cancer Prevention Week runs this week from the 21st to the 27th of January, it's quite timely that we have the opportunity to raise awareness about this extremely important subject this evening. I would like to remind Chamber of my background as a registered nurse, where much of my experience was working in the operating room to support gynaecologists in their work following positive results, which required less invasive action compared to the more invasive surgery required for women who didn't attend for screening at all. Presiding officer, as outlined in the motion, the latest statistics show cervical screening rates are falling in Scotland and all women aged from 25 to 64 are invited for cervical screening um, and that's for every three years between 25 to age 49 and then every five years from age 50 to 64. I was shocked to read that one in four women are not taking up their invitation and this is, as we know, a relatively simple test. Indeed, approximately 6,000 women across the Fries and Galloway in my South Scotland region have not responded to their invitation to attend their GP surgery, practice nurse or se sexual health clinic. It is important to acknowledge that cervical screening is the best protection against cervical cancer and that attendance for screening appointments mean that there will be increased diagnosis and as with many diseases and conditions, early diagnosis is absolutely key to effective early treatment. Presiding officer, I'd like to use my time that I have to highlight some of the unique work being developed by my former medical colleagues, including researchers in NHS and Fries and Galloway. 
Dr Heather Curry and Dr William Forson, Dr Gwen Baxter and Dr Jim Lawrence, whom I met with last year to discuss their proposal for the research for the self-testing of cervical screening. And as recently as last Friday, I caught up with Dr Forson for an update, and I'm pleased that the self-test pilot scheme has now gained approval by the Ethics Committee and will roll out soon across NHS to Freeson Galloway. The team mentioned above have developed the self-test swab sample to be gathered, which meets the required criteria for testing for the human papillomavirus. And uh, this unique swab sample, and I know we didn't like to have uh, um, props, but I have a unique swab sample packet right here with me that shows it's a wee cotton bud type swab and uh, PCR media solution. The goal is for the current process to be followed. So instead of having cytology um, is samples being done, the HPV cotton bud may be done, and that would be um, replicated in current places for obtaining um, cell samples. And ultimately, the research is to offer the non-attenders, those 6,000 non-attenders known as defaulters, to attend and provide the opportunity to self-test in their own home. The self-test swab kit costs less than two pounds. Research has shown that the self-test kit, which has proven to work in other study populations, one I know of in Africa, but in Canada as well, and it's been tested in the Netherlands, it could be applied here in Scotland to help attract the non-attenders to take up cervical screening and simultaneously work to address the barriers to attending, such as cold speculums, um, exposure and discomfort and embarrassment and lack of knowledge even. And often the challenges are work life constraints and uh, even including transport to and from work home to places for samplings, sampling to be obtained. So women really can be quite challenged when they are finding the time to get to their, uh, their appointments and I'm one of them. I have been a defaulter, but I am now taking proactive steps to get uh, myself to my nurse practitioner. I'm also aware that some health professionals across Scotland um, are a bit put off because they often know their colleagues and friends who carry out the screening. Um, other countries, as I've mentioned, Netherlands, are trying this self-testing approach, which I am looking forward to hearing the results about. So I would therefore encourage the Scottish Government to closely explore and engage in the outcomes of the self-test research. And if it works, look at options of a self-test screen kit to be rolled out across the whole of Scotland. Presiding officer, cervical cancer is the most common cancer in women aged 25 to 35 in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And around six women every week in Scotland are diagnosed with cervical cancer. The screening saves around 5,000 lives every year in the UK and prevents eight out of 10 cervical cancers from developing or spreading. It's so crucial to encourage women to attend and be screened. And I'm also aware of the innovative work from various businesses across Scotland. Uh, Monica Lennon has mentioned one. There's also one in Dumfries called Bellissimo Salon, yeah. who offer Do women money close, for please. waxing off for treatments so that they can then go and have their cervical screening test. So, I would encourage everyone to take up their offer when they're invited for their cervical screening. Thank you. Miles Briggs, followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating and thanking uh, Monica Lennon for bringing forward this debate on an important issue of screening uptake for cervical cancer. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the organisations, including Joe's uh, Cervical Cancer Trust, for the briefings they've provided us all ahead of this debate. The reason that cervical cancer screening rates are so important is because it saves lives, as has been outlined, preventing eight out of 10 cervical cancers from developing. And I hope today, collectively, we can send out a message that screening saves lives and can save hundreds of Scottish women's lives every year if they go to their screening. In Scotland, approximately six women are diagnosed with cervical cancer every week, six women every week. So the numbers and the potential to reduce that is really if we can have uptake uh, increase around screening and increase that uptake. And cervical screening, screening is lowest amongst younger women as has been outlined already, which is particularly concerning, I think, for many of us, as cervical cancer is most common in women under the age of 35 in Scotland and across the UK. A survey carried out by Joe's 
uh, Cancer Trust asked 2,005 women aged between 25 and 35 about why they would delay or not go for a screening test. The results, as we've heard already, found that a lot of it was about embarrassment and young women who delay or don't go for screening tests. 71% actually felt scared, 75% felt vulnerable, 81% said they were embarrassed, and 67% responded that they felt they had no control over the screening and the test. This survey, I think, was incredibly important for finding out from women what, they would, what would make them delay or not take up the invitation for a test. 27% said they were concerned about making a fuss, 18% afraid of being judged, and 18% thinking their concerns were too small or, or silly to actually go uh, for the screening. Almost half of the women surveyed said they, were re they regularly delayed or did not take up the invitation of a test. Now, if uptake of screening is going to be improved and the concerns of women which have been outlined are going to be addressed, then we need to see progress. So I really do welcome, and I think this week, um, again, is great for us to have this debate, um, that Joe's Cancer Trust has launched their Smear for Smear social media campaign to raise awareness of what a smear test is for and why they're important and provide support and advice to women who are, going to make, uh, who are going for a test to make it feel less daunting. As well as providing support and advice on the campaign, the campaign aim aims to act um, as a reminder to women to book their test if they are put off or have been meaning to do. You know, in busy lives, people often do put these things off, but it's something we should look to, to change. And I think men also have a role to play in this, because Ali Maxwell, the son of Joe Maxwell, who's the who the charity is named after, has said that men should play a role in actually understanding the importance of tests and encouraging our mothers, daughters, sisters, partners, and friends to go and take the test. And I think that's something which too often we have these debates where we're encouraging women to actually remind men, but this is an opportunity to show how men can actually play a role in helping to address some of the fears around smears. Um, the survey revealed that 72% of women delayed or missed the test because of embarrassment. And uh, as has been already mentioned, of a stranger examining um, intimate areas and 44% not knowing how to talk to a stranger about this. And I think that's important that these sorts of um, public information campaigns are able to really tackle uh, these issues. And as has already been outlined, I think sometimes many people who work in the health professionals feel they might go and see other health professionals. So how we can actually look towards um, you know, reassuring people is important. The cross-party group on cancer last week published our inquiry into the Scottish Government's cancer strategy and highlight, highlighted some progress. And I think one area um, which we did see progress in terms of public information campaign um, was about the flower campaign. I think that's something I hope the government looks to repeat in the future. But we still face significant challenges around cervical cancer with incidence rates increasing by 19.1% over the last uh, decade. So in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to hear um, from ministers this evening potentially what work has been undertaken to develop reminders for women to further look towards how we can use technology around um, screening uh, reminders, such as email and automated text messaging on top of the letter which is received uh, from their local health board. Finally, to conclude, I think we should all look to address the barriers stopping women addressing screening, addre accessing screening. Campaigns such as Smear for Smear can make a huge difference in improving uptake rates for cervical screening and reduce uh, the number of women in Scotland and across the UK who are diagnosed with cancer every year. Thank you. Elaine Smith, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer, and I too am grateful to Monica Lennon for bringing this matter to the Chamber during Cervical Cancer Prevention Week. I believe there's some um, discussion about how to pronounce it, but I'm sticking with the West Coast way. <laughs> it's vitally important, however we pronounce it, for women's health that women take up the invitation to go for a cervical smear test. So it's worrying that the numbers doing so are in decline, and this needs to be addressed as a priority. It may need another government public health campaign to try and raise awareness of the benefits of the smear test and provide reassurance. And as we know, there is currently a charity campaign running by Joe's Cervical Trust. That UK-wide charity was set up by James Maxwell in memory of his wife, Joe, who died from cervical cancer, and it provides high quality information and support to help prevent cancer and reduce the impact for those affected both by cervical cancer and by abnormalities and campaigns for excellence in treatment and prevention. 
Last year, the Bee Cervix Savvy Roadshow toured the country and it provided information and support about um, screening and cancer to local communities, including in Scotland. The purpose of that roadshow was to ensure that more people know what cervical screening is, what to expect at the test and the role of it in preventing cancer, learn about cancer and how to spot the symptoms and find out who can have the HPV vaccine and why. I visited the roadshow bus last year when it was in Coat Bridge and it was kept very busy with lots of women and some men accompanying them to find out more. As we've had some discussion of, and I think as the women in the chamber will know, it is more often the fear of the smear test and a possible bad result rather than necessarily a negative experience with the test itself that can stop women from attending. Now, while the test is certainly not comfortable, it shouldn't be painful. And I think making sure that women know this and encouraging, uh, is important and encouraging them to attend their appointments. Also, discussing the outcomes if a bad result is received is crucial and particularly focusing on the excellent chances of treating cervical cancer if it's caught quickly. And that's something that Monica Lennon did point out in her opening speech. Joe Cervical Trust can help with information and advice about the test. They give useful tips like ensuring that it's a woman doctor or nurse that you see if that makes you feel more comfortable about going for the test. And I have to say, in my own personal experience, the only time that I did have a bad experience with the test when I was quite young uh, was a male doctor. And so personally, I would always try and ensure that it was a female doctor or nurse that I was seeing. Um, they also highlight the particular issues that women who are survivors of sexual abuse might have with screening and they provide specific advice and support and a further area of the website provides helpful advice for women with learning disabilities. The current uh, campaign by the Trust is underpinned by new research which, as we've heard, shows that young women who delay or don't attend can feel scared, vulnerable and embarrassed at the thought of going. Two thirds said they wouldn't feel in control during the test, so it's important to show them ways that they can be in control. I think addressing these issues would no doubt help to boost the screening numbers. The idea of invasive screening can be particularly off-putting for young women and more research into ways to conduct less in, um, invasive screening would be extremely welcome. And I was very interested to listen to uh, Emma Harper's contribution on some of the research that has um, been taking place, some of the new research into the issue of screening, certainly. Emma Harper. Thank you for taking that intervention. You mentioned um, people that had been on the receiving end of sexual violence. Do you think a self-test approach might be a way to support women um, in that experience? Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I think, uh, yes, it, would, it certainly could be an option. Um, I think always that, I mean, my own views on it would be that whatever makes women feel comfortable to take the test should be explored all, all options for that should be explored till we try and accommodate ways that everyone can feel comfortable. Um, I think also uh, we have to look at ways that out of hours, can, out of hours provision can be given and also that um, employers are more sympathetic to letting women have time off work to go for the tests. And closing, presiding officer, because I noticed I'm over my time, could I mention an issue that I don't believe is given enough thought or action to tackle it? And that issue is that for many women who are homeless, living on sh or streets or in hostel accommodation or in women's refuges, then the opportunity to get health screening, for example, for breast um, cancer screening or cervical smear tests, is not available to them. They don't receive letters of appointment, they might not have a GP, or they've no idea how to go about getting screening. Um, in all probability, it might seem like the least of their worries, but it is something as a society we should all be concerned about. And I'd be interested in the Minister's comments on how that particular issue could be addressed going forward. Once again, can I thank Monica Lennon for bringing this important women's health issue to the Chamber and thank you for the bit of extra time. Thank you. Alison Johnson, followed by Rona Mackay. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too thank Monica Lennon for bringing this important issue to the Chamber tonight during Cervical Cancer Prevention Week. I think it's fair to say we all agree on the importance of getting regular health checks, and cervical cancer is no different. Um, we're aware that the uptake of screenings or the smear test has fallen dramatically across Scotland in recent years, and around 73% of women in Scotland currently access screening but this is consistently lower than uptake levels in Northern Ireland and Wales, which is a little higher at around 77%. Um, I was really concerned to note that Lothian region has the second lowest uptake rate in the country. Um, as Miles Briggs noted, the, the rates are closely linked to age 
um, but they're also linked to socioeconomic factors too. So young women have the lowest levels of uptake and uptake is particularly low among women living in areas of greatest deprivation. So increasing levels of uptake across all backgrounds, across all regions is vital because screening, cervical screening saves around 5,000 lives a year and prevents up to eight out of 10 cervical cancers. And research by Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust reveals some of the issues that have been affecting uptake. The availability of GP appointments can vary widely between different areas. Almost one in 10 women were only offered times they couldn't make when they last tried to book an appointment, with around seven of those questioned by the Trust being told no appointments were available when they called for a screening. So sometimes you put it off at that moment and then you never get around to making that appointment again. The demands of the workplace too, they're a barrier for many women with a fifth finding it a struggle to fit an appointment time around their job. Over a tenth of those surveyed by Joe's Trust said they'd be more likely to book an appointment if they didn't need to use annual leave from work to do so. Another barrier is the decline of screenings at sexual health centres. A higher than average number of abnormal results come from tests taken at these clinics. So they're of great importance to ensuring that worrying changes are noticed at the earliest opportunity. In Scotland, provision of screenings at sexual health clinics varies widely. In Forth Valley in 2017, only five tests were taken, while over 4,000 screenings took place in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. A huge difference there. Mobility is another barrier faced by women, particularly for those who are housebound. Getting a GP to visit for a screening isn't always possible. And I think um, Emma Harper's contribution on a potential pilot is something that I would warmly welcome. But the thought, uh, as Elaine Smith touched on, the thought of attending a screening can be particularly difficult or traumatic for women who have experienced sexual violence. The procedure itself or having to discuss the process with a GP can be a really challenging barrier to overcome. Um, and I'd just like to highlight to members specialist clinics such as My Body Back Project in Glasgow and urge that additional funding is available for these oversubscribed services. And I think having accessible information on cervical screenings in a range of languages is also vital. We really do need to get smarter with how we communicate with women about attending regular screenings. Um, the more women focused and responsive appointment systems can be, the better chance they'll have of reversing the decline in uptake. Nationwide text or email campaigns could reach new audiences. Indeed, reminders to attend a screening have been popping up on Twitter timelines. More innovation like this is needed, especially as there are ga gaps in the data. Uh, we have gaps available on who's not attending. Uh, better data, for example, collecting HBV vaccination status alongside smear results would allow for more targeted activity, um, saving money and resources in the long term. And, you know, again, onto that, that call for self-sampling pilots. Better data systems could improve the reliability of results here too and overcome some of the barriers around getting the time to attend a surgery because 80 percent of women surveyed by joe's trust did say they'd prefer to do an alternative screening themselves at home and that's rising to 88 percent amongst those who've put off getting an appointment it can empower those women who've experienced sexual violence to take the test into their own hands um, I, I will close presiding officer i'd just like to say that i think we also need to look at you know, how we might incentivise GPs to help boost uptake rates. There are incentives for, um, you know, we, we know that, that some actions GPs take are incentivised, and I think we need to, to look at that. I think it's fair to say, though, that there's much that can be done to address this decline, and we need to get better at collecting data. We need to fully understand why some women struggle to attend, why they're loath to do so. And I think um, developing the reliability of that self-test at home should also be prioritised in the meantime as a way to help the most vulnerable women. Thank you. Rona Mackay, followed by Annie Wales. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I add my thanks to Monica Lennon for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. The speeches we've heard today drive home just how vital it is to highlight this issue. And I think there's been some fantastic points raised right across the Chamber. Um, presiding officer, cervical cancer is the 14th most common cancer in females in the UK, accounting for around 2% of all new cancer cases. Almost all cases of cervical cancer are caused by a common virus called human papillomavirus, HPV. Presiding officer, cervical cancer screening is a great NHS success story. 
It's been available all my adult life and, and can pick up any abnormalities at an early stage, which leads to painless treatment preventing cancer. All women from the age of 25 to 65 are invited to attend cervical screening. And I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever missed receiving a reminder. So this system works. It saves 5,000 women's lives a year throughout the UK. In 2017-18, 3,788 382 cervical screening tests were processed in Scotland. And of course, for the past 10 years, the HPV vaccine has been offered to girls from S1 to S3 in Scottish secondary schools, a fantastic public health initiative. The immunisation helps protect against the types of HPV that cause 75% of the cases of cervical cancer. But alarmingly, presiding officer, as we've heard, according to the report by Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust, 72.8% of eligible women in Scotland aged 25 to 64 were recorded as being screened and just 56% of young women attended in Glasgow. It's the most common cancer in women aged 25 to 35 years of age in Scotland. And research shows, as we've heard, that most don't attend because they're scared or embarrassed. So we must reach out to young people to stress how important it is to do this test. The test is to prevent, not find cancer. And I agree totally with Monica Lennon on trauma-informed screening, with Emma Harper on the self-test screening. That's really, really positive news. And yes, it can be uncomfortable, but it takes less than two minutes. And that two minutes may be the most important two minutes you will spend. Uptake of screening is, the, is poorest in younger women and increases with age to a peak at 50 to 54 years. In addition, uptake of screening was highest in women from the least deprived areas, and fell with increasing deprivation, which is really worrying. Um, and it's, as Alison Johnson had mentioned, um, I thought Elaine C. Smith made a, a vital point about homeless or marginalized women not being screened. And again, that's, that's something that needs to be addressed. So any abnormality will be picked up and dealt with. And only around 1% of tests had high grade abnormality. 7.2% had low grade and almost 92% were clear. Screening uptake is, ha is highest in HPV vaccinated women uh, across all ages when compared to non-vaccinated women. This may be due to immunized women being more aware of the risks involved af after vaccinations thanks to the education during the immunization program. And I believe education is a key part in getting the message across. My hope is that it becomes the norm for women and girls, just like going for a dental checkup or eye examinations, no big deal, just something we have to do. Presiding officer, let's get the message out loud and clear to women and girls. This test is too important to miss. It will give you peace of mind that everything is okay, but more importantly, it could save your life. The last of the open debate contributions is from Annie Wales. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too wish to thank Monica Lennon for bringing this debate to the Chamber today during Cervical, Cervical Cancer Awareness um, Prevention Week. Cervical screening, put simply, saves lives. But despite this, however, one in four women are not taking up their invitation for a cervical screening, putting themselves at risk of having undetected cervical cancer. What's key is that we try and understand why screening attendance is falling and what, barriers are, what the barriers are to women getting the test done and how we ensure every single woman has information and opportunities they need to access cervical screening. Bearing in mind this is a free health test available to every woman in Scotland, acknowledging the barriers and factors preventing women taking up their invitation is essential. And as we've already heard, for many women, the test can be uncomfortable and slightly embarrassing. It's one of those tick box exercises which, if you put off amongst a list of countless other things to do, may have no immediate or obvious repercussions. A survey of more than 2,000 women by Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust found that a third of young women were too embarrassed to go to their test because of body shape. And for some women, it's much more difficult, possibly having had a previous bad experience at a test or an experience of sexual violence. And that's why I was encouraged to hear from Emma Harper about the, the pilot for self-tests, something which I, I welcome. Um, and what's paramount is that women are given the information to allow them to overcome these barriers. If women feel embarrassed about having the test done, <clears throat> they need to be informed, whether through a public campaign 
or social media, that they can specify a female nurse, that they need only undress waist down, and that for most the test isn't painful at all. And when reading around the topic, I was really encouraged to see celebrities posting about their own smear test experiences on social media. Ten years ago, Jade Goodey sadly lost her life to cervical cancer, after which cervical screening rates rose thanks to an extensive media coverage and her work in raising awareness. <clears throat> However, 10 years later, statistics have dipped, as we've heard. And most alarmingly in Scotland, the biggest fall in cervical screening uptake is amongst the 25 to 29 year olds, with more than one in three not taking up their invitation. As cynical as sometimes might be about social, might be about social media, the power to raise awareness amongst this group is great. There are many great campaigns out there that young women and men can join in to spread the word among their friendship groups. And as we've heard, the Smear for, the Smear, for Smear campaign, for example, encourages people to share their smeared lipstick selfies along with tips and words of support during Cervical Cancer Prevention Week. Innovation is, of course, key. And in my hometown, Glasgow, I've had the pleasure of meeting representative from Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust at the Beast Cervic Savvy Roadshow, once in Buchanan Street and once in George Square as part of their mobile unit service. And in these prime locations, it was easy to see how information could be easily shared. And I too, like Monica Lennon has already stated, was very pleased to see in the local press last week the initiative of the Glasgow Petition, who is offering a free wax treatment for anyone that has a confirmed smear test appointment. To conclude today, I'd like again to thank Monica Lennon for bringing this debate to the Chamber during Cervical Cancer Prevention Week. We cannot allow the cervical screening uptake to continue to slip any further, or we run the risk of seeing diagnosis rates for what is often a preventable cancer rise. There is no one quick fix to turning around this situation, but by working together and raising awareness, we can hopefully save lives. Thank you. <clears throat> I now call Claire Hockey to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to thank members who have contributed to this debate today and to Monica Lennon for bringing it to the Chamber. Cervical screening is unique. Not only can it detect cancer early, but it can also prevent cervical cancer before it even begins. The screening test detects precancerous cell changes, mainly caused by the human papilloma virus a virus that 80% of us will get at some point in our lifetime. And treatment as a result of screening prevents eight out of 10 cervical cancers from developing. There is no doubt therefore that the cervical screening programme saves lives and it's the best protection against cervical cancer. As a woman myself who has been for a smear test, I believe we must do all we can do to encourage eligible women to take up their cervical screening invitation. I agree with members that it is disappointing that uptake rates for cervical screening continue to decline. Latest figures show that just 72.8% of eligible women attend screening in Scotland, and this is down from 73.4% in 2017 and around 80% 10 years ago. And this trend is not unique to Scotland, it's mirrored across the UK. In my own constituency of Rutherglen, the most recent uptake data ranges from a high of 84.7% to a low of 62.4%. Uptake of screening was highest in women from the least deprived areas and fell with increasing deprivation. So what's putting women off getting tested? Evidence shows that there are a number of barriers, including comp complex emotional obstacles such as fear, body shame and embarrassment to practical barriers such as struggling to attend an appointment due to work commitments or childcare. New research from Joe's Cervical uh, Cancer Trust and Scottish Government showed that two thirds of Scottish women are unaware that not attending cervical screening is the biggest risk factor for developing cervical cancer. Awareness raising is therefore very important, but we must also recognise that uptake is lowest in our least affluent communities. The Scottish Government's cancer strategy is investing up to £5 million in our NHS national cancer screening programmes, including a cervical to improve outcomes. And these funds are supporting innovative projects, working to tackle inequalities and encourage participation in screening programmes from communities where 
individuals are least likely to take part. So far, we've committed over £2.7 million to support 25 projects. Cervical Cancer Prevention Week gives us the opportunity to recognise and celebrate the good work currently being undertaken to tackle inequalities of access and to raise awareness of cervical screening in Scotland. And the Scottish Government warmly welcomes the input of Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust to the Scottish Cervical Screening Programme and we work very closely with the Trust to encourage women to attend screening, especially in hard to reach groups. Joe's have received funding under the Cancer Strategy for a Glasgow outreach service which targets specific groups where there are significant health inequalities and a higher rate of non-attendance. And they work with local GP practices, sexual health clinics, community groups and volunteers to improve access to and uptake of cervical screening. Last year, Joes ran their first ever Scottish B Cervix Savvy Roadshow, which visited high streets and retail parks across Scotland, increasing awareness by addressing public knowledge around cervical screening and cancer. I was pleased to learn that two community workers from my own constituency of Rutherglen were trained as volunteers and joined the road show when it travelled to Lanarkshire. The Scottish Government Cancer Strategy is also supporting Clyde Gateway, Scotland's biggest and most ambitious regeneration programme to tackle inequalities in access to screening. The Clyde project includes the creation of additional monthly cervical screening clinics, and this gives women the choice of a more convenient appointment time increasing flexibility and accessibility and the, yes sir. Elaine Smith thank you I uh, thank the minister for taking the intervention some of the projects mentioned earlier uh, I wonder if any of them involve working with women who are homeless Claire Hawkey I was going to address that point a bit further on in my speech so I, I, I will do that if that's all right with, with, with Elaine Smith um, they have also developed a community health pathway in the community of Burnhill in Rutherglen, the second most deprived community in South Lanarkshire. 337 local residents have been consulted through door-to-door -door engagement, supplemented with residents on the street and via local activity groups. And these are just a few of the excellent projects which are currently underway and have only just touched the surface. It's vital that we continue to explore how screening can be more effective at reaching those in greatest need and we will bring together all the learning gathered from these projects in a cohesive and coordinated strategy to reduce screening inequalities. We're complementing this work with our cervical screening awareness campaign flower, which started running in cinemas yesterday and which will run across digital platforms from the 28th of January. The campaign targets 25 to 35 year old women who we know are less likely to attend. And the campaign encourages women to take up their screening invitation and recommends women who missed their last appointment or who have never been screened contact their GP. I'd also like to take this moment to thank all those who are undertaking vital work in raising the awareness of the importance of cervical screening. Finally, presiding officer, I would like to briefly mention our cervical cancer vaccination programme, which we introduced in 2008. Since the programme was introduced, uptake rates have remained high and continue to exceed 80%. The programme has been evaluated since it began and is already showing encouraging and positive signs that the rate of cervical cancer caused by the HPV virus will reduce in future. However, the vaccine does not protect against all cervical cancers, so regular screening is still important and will continue to be an essential part of our armoury for years to come. And we must continue to get this message out to young women. And if I could address a couple of the, the issues that members raised during um, the debate, um, Emma Harper asked about or spoke about the uh, self-screening and yes, NHS uh, Dumfries and Galloway is um, a, do, uh, carrying out a small scale pilot in the board um, and we're looking at the possibility of a national pilot. The UK Screening Committee um, are looking at the evidence for self-sampling and we're awaiting their advice um, for proceeding further with that. Um, I was asked about um, by Miles Briggs and Alison Johnson about looking at the potential of digital communications um, to encourage people to take up their invitation for um, screening. And as part of the work under the cancer strategy, learning will be used to develop future communication plans, including obviously looking at uh, di digital and technology. And uh, Elaine Smith asked me about um, homelessness. And there's a number of projects currently um, through the cancer strategy, 
where we're looking at how screening services can be improved for hard to reach groups, which would of course include um, women and men um, uh, who are homeless, those with learning disabilities, and also those with mental health issues. President Officer, uh, we here tonight share the same ambitions to make cervical screening accessible to all women across Scotland, regardless of where they live, and by understanding and reducing the barriers that women face. We all have a role in sharing the potentially life-saving messages about cervical screening with all the women in our lives. So together, let's nip cervical cancer in the bud. Thank you. That concludes the debate on cervical screening update statistics and I close this meeting. Thank you.